The year was 1844 in Vienna, Austria, a cultural and intellectual hub of Europe. Excited to explore the city and make it his own was a recent graduate, Dr. Ignis Semmelweis, who completed his doctorate studies at the University of Pest in Vienna. The bright-eyed and bushy-tailed doctor had a passion for obstetrics and gynecology, or the study of pregnancy, childbirth, and female reproductive organs. His enthusiasm was well-received, and he was hired as an assistant at a clinic in Vienna. Everything was going according to plan. Not long after his arrival, Ignis noticed a tragic phenomenon occurring within the clinic. You see, it was split into two departments. The first was operated by trained physicians, residents, and medical students. The second was operated exclusively by midwives, or individuals, often women, who assisted with childbirth despite usually not having gone to medical school. For some reason, the mortality rate of mothers in the first clinic being treated by doctors was significantly higher than the mothers being treated by midwives. Not marginally either, but five times higher. This wasn't a casual observation either. This phenomenon was well known throughout Vienna, so much so that women begged not to be sent into the doctor's clinic. Ignis even witnessed women choosing a street birth on the sidewalk rather than being sent behind the doors of death. Ironically, these street births had lower mortality rates as well. Ignis couldn't bear to witness the horror. He had to figure out why so many mothers were dying at the hands of trained doctors. He began experimenting with the differences between the two clinics. First, the midwives had women give birth on their sides, while the doctors had them do it on their backs. So he started turning women over. No difference. Next, Ignis noticed that when a patient would die in the doctor's clinic, a priest would walk through the hospital ringing a bell. Ignis theorized the sound of the bell was so piercing and surprising that it put women in great distress, causing their hearts to stop. So he stopped the priests from ringing their bells. No difference. Was it the climate? Was it something to do with the shape of the buildings? Sunlight through the windows? Nope, nope, nope. He was stumped. He was also demoted. Ignis had become obsessed with solving the case of these dying mothers, much to the chagrin of his superiors. His bosses hadn't hired him to play medical detective, they hired him to be an assistant. His persistence on studying the mortality issue nearly cost him his job. Frustrated and confused, Ignis took a vacation. He spent a month in Venice enjoying the sun and the art to clear his head. Maybe the deaths were a fluke, maybe an act of God, maybe he should just give up. Well, thank goodness he didn't. Upon his return to Vienna, Ignis was confronted with tragic news. A dear colleague of his, Dr. Jacob Kolechka, had fallen suddenly ill and died. What happened, Ignis asked. The answer changed Ignis' life and the world of medicine forever. Dr. Kolechka had been performing an autopsy on a deceased patient. During the procedure, he had accidentally cut open his finger. According to those in the room, Dr. Kolechka, grimacing through the pain of the cut, continued examining the warm, rotting body of the deceased patient. With an ungloved hand and a fresh wound, he naively dug through the decaying corpse. Shortly after, his hand became infected. He developed a fever, fell gravely ill, and died just a few short days later. The light bulb went off in Ignis' head. The cut, he exclaimed. Dr. Kolechka had cut open his hand, which must have exposed his bloodstream to something deadly within the cadaver's body. Ignis raced to his notes. He poured over every chart of every mother who died. It dawned on him. Doctors in the clinic were performing autopsies on dead bodies, and then using those same hands to deliver babies. The midwives in the second clinic never performed autopsies. They only delivered babies, meaning their hands never came in contact with decaying flesh. The doctors must be transferring some sort of cadaverous particles from the dead to the living. But what were those particles? Of course, today we know exactly what those particles were. Germs. We know there are germs on every surface we touch every day, especially on and inside deceased bodies. We know germs are constantly trying to enter our insides and infect our wounds. We also know one of the most effective methods in battling germs is the simple practice of washing your hands. Unfortunately, in 1847, not a single person on the planet Earth had ever heard of germs. You see, the germ theory, or the principle that microscopic bacteria cause organic matter to rot and spread illness, was still a few years away. Ignis mm. didn't realize exactly how accurate his theory was, but he did know it was time mm. to test it. His thinking was very straightforward. Putting your hands inside a dead body makes them dirty. So before we put our hands in another patient, we should clean them. So the experiments began. 
Ignis instructed medical students to begin dipping their hands in a solution of chlorinated lime before delivering babies. Why? Well, rotting flesh smells bad, and this chlorinated lime was the best at eliminating that smell from your hands. Little did Ignis know that chlorine is actually one of the strongest and safest disinfectants in the world, which is why it's so often used in swimming pools. The results were immediate and significant. According to Ignis's meticulous records, the mortality rate in a doctor's clinic dropped from 18% to under 2%. He'd done it. Ignis had proved the idea that washing your hands would save lives. Ignis then became rich and famous and everyone loved him forever the end. Not quite. We still haven't gotten to his murder. Ignis was thrilled with this discovery. The doctors who worked under him saw the results of washing their hands and believed Ignis's theory about deadly particles. The same sentiment was not held by Ignis's superiors, nor the medical community at large. Ignis had rubbed a lot of people the wrong way over the years with his obsession over maternal mortality rates. He had also actively engaged in controversial political debate within Austria in the late 1840s. He'd made enemies, and when Ignis began to preach his findings that washing hands saved lives, he was met with crossed arms and suspicious glances. But he was obviously correct, so how could he be denied? Today, medicine is guided by science, research, and data. For most of human history, and especially in Austria in the 1800s, it was not. At the time, the medical establishment believed all illnesses were a result of an imbalance of humors, or an uneven balance of four substances within the body. Blood, phlegm, yellow, and black bile. Doctors believed the only cure for disease was to balance these humors, using torturous methods as well. To balance your blood, doctors would cover you in leeches. To balance your biles, they would induce vomiting or diarrhea. We now know bloodletting and excessive loss of fluids has disastrous effects on the human body, especially one that is sick. Doctors at this time were causing far more pain and disease than they actually alleviated. Some other doctors also believed in the miasma theory, that various diseases from chlamydia to even obesity could be caused by poisonous night air floating from the sick to the healthy. While this theory is not technically correct, the concept of airborne disease is real. But it wasn't until doctors like Dr. Ignis came along that science really started honing in on the whole truth. So while Ignis was saying clean hands save lives, what many doctors heard was all older doctors are wrong, filthy, and killing their own patients. It was true, but not easy to hear, let alone believe. Shockingly, Ignis was fired from his hospital. He was denied a position at a midwife clinic. He was offered a teaching position, but only if he used mannequins as opposed to actual cadavers like his peers. Ignis was insulted, so he abruptly packed up and left Vienna without saying goodbye. Ignis now established a new life in Budapest, Hungary. He married, had children, opened up a private practice, and revolutionized Hungarian maternity wards, where the mortality rate dropped to 0.85%, while rates in Vienna for the same time period, where his hygiene practices were not in use, were over a thousand percent higher. As time went on, Ignis became more bold and confident in his theory. He published a book that he sent to the heads of major medical departments all around the globe. Ignis assumed this would change the world. But again, his writings were met with skepticism from decision makers who were hesitant to believe invisible particles from dead bodies were killing people. This enraged Ignis, and he began writing furious public letters to those who opposed him. The letters were extreme, often calling the doctors irresponsible murderers and admonishing them for their ignorance. However, his offensive tone only made physicians more resistant to his hygienic preachings. After some time, something changed in Ignis. He became depressed, bitter, and behaved grossly out of character. It was theorized that these symptoms described the late stage case of syphilis, which was common amongst doctors who spent their careers delivering children without wearing gloves, scrubs, or masks. Ignis's colleagues were concerned with this madness and in 1865 invited him to tour a new insane asylum that had been built in Vienna. Ignis accepted the invitation, hoping to reconnect with old friends while touring a medical facility. Once inside, Ignis's friends began telling him of their concerns for his well-being. It dawned on him, this wasn't a tour, it was a trap. He bolted for the door, only to be stopped by a guard. He turned to the other direction, but more guards stood in his way. As they closed in on him, Ignis thrashed and clawed for his life. The guards beat him violently until he lay delirious on the floor. They stuffed him in a straitjacket and dragged him away. 
During the fight, Ignis had sustained a significant injury to his hand and it bled right through his straitjacket. Infection took over and spread throughout his entire body. Just two short weeks later, 47-year-old Dr. Ignis Semmelweis died of infection. The very thing he worked his entire life to prevent. Shortly after Ignis' death, French chemist Dr. Louis Pasteur penned the germ theory, which finally gave a theoretical explanation for why Dr. Semmelweis's method of washing your hands prevents the spread of disease. His discovery of proper hygiene in hospital settings has saved and prolonged billions of lives. But it's not all he's responsible for. The home he was raised in has been turned into the Semmelweis Museum. Semmelweis University in Budapest is named after him. And he's also credited with the name of the Semmelweis reflex, a term for the rejection of new information because it contradicts what you think you already know. George Washington was actually killed by his doctors attempting to balance his humors, so click here to learn about that and what killed every other US president. As always, stay happy and healthy.